How I wish one could wear a poison ring and refuse to ever be parted from it, Catherine Whitehorn wrote five years ago in a piece entitled What the Death of My Cat Taught Me About Assisted Dying. The brilliant, witty, convention-defying columnist laid out clearly her own belief that people had the right to die with dignity of their own choosing. Her friends and family recognised her words and agreed with much of what she said. But now Ms Whitehorn has Alzheimer's and her son is wondering whether she was right after all. Polly Toynbee, her former colleague, broke the news of her dementia to the wider world. She's here now and we're joined by her son Bernard Lyle. If I can start with you, uh, Bernard, do, do you remember um, your mum talking about death with you? Do you remember her, I don't know whether you say dying wishes or wishes for dying? I don't recall that many conversations. I know uh, she had a, a kind of a living will and uh, she's shown it to me and made sure I knew where it was, and that kind of thing. It wasn't a topic that came up very much, but you know, I, I did know more or less what her sentiments were, for sure. Because she wrote about it quite clearly with you, uh, Polly. You, you, you remember her writing that she had thought very long and hard about her sister dying and she sort of knew which way she would go on that. She'd been on a... Um... She'd been on a trip to Oregon where they have assisted dying and wrote about it with great approval, said it worked very well, it was the system we should have here. And um, it's just a terrible tragedy that somebody so witty and clever and uh, such a brilliant writer has ended up, through nobody's fault, in a condition that she most wouldn't have wanted to be in, that her her conscious self, if she could see herself now, would I be very appalled at the prospect, as would most people. I would be horrified and I would also, as she did, wish beyond anything that I could make sure it didn't happen to me. But when she wrote about uh, wanting to choose her own death, it, it was presumably if she was in severe pain or if she was not functioning. I mean, n now she is... She's very calm. She's very. She's not in pain, is she? No, no, no. Sure, she, she is. She has had sort of moments of despair, but I should say generally, she's she's fairly content. And I'd also say that she hasn't she hasn't really mentioned anything about uh, the idea of the sister dying or or wanting to die or anything like this for you know a good couple of years. And uh, you know, it's, her diagnosis was a good half dozen years ago at least. So does it make you think that the Catherine of then uh, is not the Catherine of now, that she yes, wouldn't absolutely. want that now? I don't think she does. I, th I, think she, I think she lives very much in the present um, for the most part. I, I think, yes, the younger Catherine would be horrified to see the situation she's in now. She'd, be, she'd probably be quite unsympathetic, to be perfectly honest with you. But, but she's not here. And, and the, the Catherine that is here now um, you know, she, she's, she's not the person she would have wanted to be, but generally speaking, she gets along, she, she makes the best of it, she's doing all right. So am I right you know. in thinking that you and close family now wouldn't dream of thinking of, of helping her to her death as she is? Well, there's no opportunity to help people. The only thing that's available to anybody is, is simply to, to not, uh, you know, to, uh, to do withhold medication or things like this and, and yeah for sure actually in certain circumstances I would do that um, I wouldn't want to submit her to you know, subject her to invasive hospital procedures um, the business of withholding antibiotics is complicated it, you know it, it, how I would react in that circumstance has much to do with what kind of advice I was given and how definite I thought the outcome could be you know the the, the idea of withholding medication and her having a horrible few weeks and then pulling through doesn't strike me as much of a result, you know. I guess you the know. difficulty is, um, Polly, when you're dealing with something like dementia, Alzheimer's, of course the person that writes the article, Compost Mentis, is not going to be the person that has Alzheimer's. So which is the one that you choose to <laughs> listen to? It's a difficult philosophical question. Who is that person now who is not the Catherine Whitehorn as was? And I don't really know the answer. Um, I don't even know, really know what the solution is, but I do think a first step is that if you do get a diagnosis of that kind, you should have the option, if you want, at some stage along the line to say, 
I've had enough. I don't want to go any further. You know, not going to Dignitas to some bleak mm. Swiss clinic, but to be able to die at a time of your choosing. But because after all, wrong? dementia is a terminal condition. But but what if what if you think that something would be unbearable? Like many people say that about disability or a wheelchair or blindness. And what if you find you're wrong, that actually it is more bearable than you thought, or you do have a fuller or at least a calmer life than you, you thought you would. You can only leave it up to the individual to decide for themselves and give them the choice, which is a choice that isn't available at the moment. By the time you're in that condition, it's no longer a choice. It's, you know, it's down to fate. Do you feel she's being denied mm. that now because nobody is willing to take her up on her wishes? There's, you know, she's not of sound enough mind to be able to, to trot off to Dignitas and, and say, no, I've had enough. Um, you know, once you've passed a certain point, once you're not of sound mind, you, you can't make the, can't be judged to make those decisions for yourself. So, as I say, all we can do is fail to help, uh, you know, certain crucial moments. But I think, I think the most important thing is, you know, she looked at us, the, uh, herself imagined herself in the future in this kind of condition with a kind of horror, with a kind of shame. It's, uh, you know, it is, we consider it to be a kind of humiliating condition to be in. But she's not experiencing those emotions now. She's not herself shameful. She's not herself humiliated. And you know, I, I, I do wonder where that, whether a lot of the way that we think about ourselves in the future in this kind of condition is, is a... It's a sort of vicarious shame, you know. Mm. It's, it's not a shame for the, you know, the person that's there now. It's a sort of shame for the person you think you they, they ought still be, to be, yeah. or something like that. I don't want to leave my thing. children in the situation that you've been left with, and I hope I don't. No. Thank you both very much indeed. Thank you. Pleasure.